Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. I'm joined today by another personal hero. I've been saying that way too much this month, and I'm going to say it a lot more as the month goes by. But uh, S.T. Joshi is the man who saved Lovecraft in, in my eyes. I grew up at a time when Lovecraft was not immediately available in my local rural bookstores. That changed in the mid-80s when Lovecraft was enjoying a renaissance. And the corrected texts of H.P. Lovecraft followed very soon after in my life when I had a little bit more money and was making my way in the world. Those texts were uh, opened my eyes again to Lovecraft for the second time. It is with extreme pride I introduce you to S.T. Joshi. Essie, how would you describe yourself to people who are not familiar with your work? Well, I've, I've been around a long time. I'm not a young man anymore, but, um, you know, <clears throat> I was born in India in the 60s, uh, actually late 50s, came to this country when I was a child uh, with my family, so I've had all my education here, settled in the Midwest, and that's, that's where I discovered Lovecraft, and it was, it was such a revelation to me. I, I just fell in love with him. Uh, and believe me, it was <laughs> then it was even harder to find some of his stuff than it was when you came along. Um, but I became so fascinated that I just had to do more work on him. And I knew that I had to get to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, because not only because Providence is where he lived most of his life, but um, because um, you know all his a lot of his papers and manuscripts and other stuff was at the Brown University Library. They make a they make a specialty of it there. So luckily I got in uh, as an undergraduate. I did a lot of work and that's where I did all the work that led to those corrected texts. And, and you know, I've done, you know, other criticism and scholarship about Lovecraft. And then Lovecraft has taken me in, in, in other directions, uh, studying other writers that he liked, like Lord Dunsany and Arthur, Arthur Mackin, uh, Alston Blackwood, all these other great writers, weird fiction, and, and even contemporary writers, Ramsey Campbell. He's great personal favorite of mine uh, and 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 I, I can think of him as a friend also um so really Lovecraft has shaped my life from beginning to end and i feel like to a, a, a lesser degree that can be said about a lot of us who discovered weird fiction at a very important time in our life but before we get to all that i just want to point out to everyone that um you know all month we're celebrating the halloween season and to me lovecraft is an essential part of that Although it's a strange part of that because it's not traditional like your vampires and your witches and ghosts. Lovecraft is very core to who I am as a person and my love of this season. So I don't want to spend this time talking about the shortcomings of a man born in 1890. I'd rather celebrate what he gave us, which is some incredibly rich literature inside a genre that too often is thought of in disparate terms. And here we have someone who gave us something of top caliber. So I'd rather spend our time today discussing the strengths, not the weaknesses, of someone who I do uh, admire from across the century. Uh, that said, so how did you discover weird fiction? And um, do you prefer that term uh, as opposed to horror fiction? Yes, I do. And of course, it's the term that Lovecraft came up I don't think he actually came up with it himself. Um, but he certainly used it a lot, uh, both in his letters and in his, uh, you know, the, the critical articles he wrote. He wrote a great piece called called Notes on Writing Weird Fiction, very important piece about his own uh, attempts uh, and, and what he believed. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I'll tell you, um, it's funny. When I came to this country, you know, I was five years old, I, you know, and I didn't know the English language. I had to learn English, uh, but it, you learn very quickly at that age. You know, it's kind of an immersion thing, you know. Um, so, um, but the funny thing is that, uh, you know, I felt like an American. I mean, I, I basically shed my Indian heritage 
much. And and that was it was expected of immigrant immigrants to do that. Uh, you had you know you were supposed to be an American. Um, you know, so I just you know those early years I just I just wanted to play football and baseball and all these little <laughs> games and stuff. You know, and hang out with my little little friends and and my older sister at one point I think I was about ten. She said, you know, you're not reading books. You got to start reading books, guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was doing well in school. School was easy. I mean, I was, you know, I was reasonably bright. I hope uh, so. That wasn't the issue. But I, she said, you know, you got to, you got to start reading, reading. So she dragged me to the public library in Muncie, Indiana, which is where where we were living at the time. Uh, nice little university town. Um, and she just said, find something. Just go read something. You know, whatever it is. And the funny thing is, I latched on. This is funny uh, in a number of ways to C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Now, at the time, believe me, I knew I knew nothing about Christianity. I mean, literally nothing. It, it's hard to imagine someone not knowing anything about this 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 religion. But you know, we we were not trained in that religion. You know, it's not our religion. So when I read these books, I had no idea that, of all this Christian symbolism that that's in you know in there. Um, the, and line, I, the line was just a lion, huh? It, that's right. They were just entertaining fantasy stories. I mean, that was fascinating, you know. Um, like Lovecraft, I've become an atheist now, and unfortunately, I can't go back and read those stories anymore. I just can't read them. I'm sorry, but um, they open up this great world to me. But gradually, I, I shifted from fantasy to pure horror. I'm not sure how that happened. It just happened. I I think I came upon a great edition of Edgar Allan Poe that was illustrated by you know some of the famous illustrators like uh, uh, Harry Clark or Edwin Dulac or whoever, and that said, wow, that that this is fabulous. I, I may have come upon Ambrose Bierce pretty early. Um, and he was great. And then <clears throat> around the age of 13, 14, I can't quite remember, but um, <clears throat> I saw these books, uh, three volumes from Arkham House Publishers, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. And, and that name may have rung a bell. I may have found a, a story of Lovecraft in an anthology before, uh, but I just I thought the name was kind of weird <laughs> and, and interesting. And, and so I picked up these books, and I tell you, that was, that was my downfall, if you want to call it that. Now, eventually, I suspect that the, you, those three books will transform under your hands into new editions that look a lot like. Yeah, yeah. The that. irony is, yeah, I, it, literally in about ten to twelve years, I will be editing new editions of those of those texts. I, I couldn't have fathomed it at the age of thirteen, fourteen, or how old I was, um, you know. But uh, that, that's it's so so amazing. And I, I have to confess, I think that my work on those corrected texts, if anything, is my great contribution to Lovecraft, uh, because you got to read Lovecraft the way he wrote it himself. I mean, insofar as he can do so. Um, otherwise, you're not reading Lovecraft. You're reading some, some Lovecraft filtered through other people's editing. And some of those texts were really, really bad. I'll tell you, the Mount from Atlas in the previous uh, Archibald edition was really, really bad. It's a whole new novel now when you read it in the, in the correct text. And so take us through that process. Uh, so you go to Brown University to, it wasn't obviously to discover how much it changed, um, but that's yeah, kind of right. where you ended up. Uh, I mean, I, I had no idea at the time uh, that, that, that uh, you know, how corrupt those texts were, but I got there, you know, as an undergraduate, I was 18 years old, but, and some other folks. I'd gotten in touch with a couple other Lovecraft people. This was really right at the, this is 1976, right at the time when there was a whole new movement. I mean, very small number of people, but we were all filled with this enthusiasm and, you know, to, to bring Lovecraft up to a higher level. We wanted to probe his work more deeply, his life more deeply. Um, the great leader at this time of, of Lovecraft studies was a man named Dirk Mosig. He was a professor down in Georgia, and I'll tell you, he he guided me for four or five years. We exchanged all these letters, just the way Lovecraft did with with his friends. You know, long, long letters. You know, talking about Lovecraft and and trying to understand him and all this stuff. It was incredible. Uh, but he was the one of several people who said, you know, Lovecraft's manuscripts are all there at Brown University in the library. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them. <clears throat> Why don't you just for your own interest or for our, you know, just see, see what, what, what's going on here. I mean, how, how accurate are these texts? And I, I may have even started with at the mountains of madness. And I said, I can't <laughs> what, what's going on here? This is all, all, all these mistakes here. What, what, what's happening? Um, and it took me 
five or six years, literally. I mean, I, I did a bachelor's and master's at Brown uh, to figure out this whole situation. It's very complicated uh, because you have to look at how these texts started from manuscript, the typescript to the first published appearance and the book appearances. I mean, it's a, it's a very involved procedure, but I said, something has to be done here. We got to get new texts out there. And so eventually I got in touch with Arkham House and that took a long time to negotiate, but uh, they finally said yes. Let's let's get some new text out there, and then in the you know mid '80s, they they happened. Now I have this picture in my head of you walking into the university with an armful of uh, Ballantine paperbacks, and uh, you know just opening page by page and just shaking your head a lot. Actually, it wasn't even. But I went to the I ha, I went I had I bought exactly those three Archibald's editions because. Okay. Uh, I didn't like well the the Valentine editions were fun because of the, you know it was wild covers and things like that, um, but I, I I literally marked up my own copies of the Archimaus editions. <laughs> I still have those marked up copies, the collector's items of a sort, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I wore them out so much. I mean that they're all <laughs> kind of battered and the spines are falling off and stuff like this. But <laughs> that's where all my corrections were made and. I'll tell you, there was there were whole passages left out about the Mountains of Madness for for reasons too too complicated to go into. Um, other texts are pretty good, you know. The Don H. was printed fairly accurately for various reasons. Um, uh, then the, the, there's there's the crazy story of the Shadow Out of Time. I just got to go into this briefly. That text I couldn't correct initially in in those Archimedes editions because the manuscript didn't exist, or, and we thought it was all lost. You know, it was gone forever because Lovecraft had given it to his young friend, Robert Barlow, down in, you know, in, down in Florida in 1935. Barlow had actually typed out the text for Lovecraft um, uh, because Lovecraft actually was so discouraged at the quality of the story that he, he didn't even want to bother sending it out anywhere <laughs> to a magazine. But Barlow, you know, at night, you know, would type out the story. Uh, unfortunately, he typed it out not very accurately. But anyway, no matter. So that's how we got the TypeScript, and you know, uh, Lovecraft started off as astounding stories, and it was accepted. Um, but Lovecraft gave the manuscript to Barlow. So what happened to Barlow? Well, he eventually went down to Mexico, actually became a world famous anthropologist in Mexico. Okay, but of course he died young. You know, we we don't want to go into that. But um, he died when he was in his thirties. And we said, okay, that must be it. I mean, either the, the manuscript is lost down there, you know, it got thrown away or something, whatever, who knows what happened. Well, the librarian at Brown University in early 1994, I think he got a call or a fax from some lady in Hawaii. She says, my sister has just died and I find among her effects, a manuscript called The Shadow Out of Time by H.P. Lovecraft. Do you want it? <laughs> and the librarian, after he fell on the floor, he, he said, "Yeah, I want." It. <laughs> she gave it to him. It was a, Barlow had given it to this woman who was a student of his. She had retired to Hawaii. She dies. Her sister finds his manuscript, gives it to Brown University as a gift. It was amazing. Um, amazing. She got a big tax write-off. I'm sure this, this manuscript <laughs> is literally priceless. I mean, it might, you know, if you have, put a price on it, it would be six figures at least. I would think. Anyway, I was privileged to be the first person to look at this manuscript. Uh, they, they, you know, they notified me, and I, I, I came up for two days. I was living in New York at the time, uh, and and then I said, "Oh my God, this text is not quite as bad as other Mountains Madness, but it's pretty bad." And so I corrected the text. It took a while for that to get into print, but it was it was one of the first publications of Hippocampus Press uh, in two thousand one. The correct text of the chapter on time. Now. Uh Lovecraft was mostly a novella and short story writer. Mm. Um, the, the case of Charles Dexter Ward is the one glaring um, exception to that rule. But it was a first draft, was it not? Oh, yes. Um, so, in fact, uh, yeah, I consider Lovecraft to have written three short novels. The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which is about yes. oh, 40,000 words, maybe a little less than that. Mars of Madness, which is like 41,000 words, and <clears throat> Charles Extra Ward, which is like 51,000 words, which is, by the way, is the exact the length of The Great Gatsby, so that's, you know, <laughs> that is a novel. You know, people didn't write huge novels back then for the most part. No. Um, anyway, um, he certainly dispensed of, of, with Dream Quest as just a, a practice novel. He actually called it that and never made any attempts to get it published. Um, Charles Dexter Ward, I think he put a lot of effort into it, certainly. 
but he didn't like the result for whatever reason. So Lovecraft was hypercritical of his own work. I mean, he never had much good to say about his writings. He never felt that he had really captured what he wanted to capture. I mean, he was, you know, his standards were so high. Um, and so he made, made no effort to, to, to uh, market that novel. I mean, other people actually, like Donald Wander, I came to visit him and, and actually read at least part of the, the manuscript, uh, you know, in Providence, you know, when he came to Lovecraft's uh, little apartment there. Uh, and I think he tried to persuade Lovecraft to, to let him type it up or, you know, but it didn't happen. And Barlow typed a little bit of it. Nothing happened to that. But, uh, and, there, you know, there are some imperfections. I'll tell you, the manuscripts are very strange because Lovecraft was chronically short of paper. I mean, he really, he, he was a poor guy and he was really poor. You know, believe me, he's unbelievably poor at some times. Uh, and so this manuscript is written on like the back of correspondence that he had gotten from other people. He, you know, if they use good paper, he could say, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll just write on the back of it." Some of it is written on some these little like lead pages out of a ledger or something. I, I can't quite tell where that came from. <laughs> uh, a weird, weird hodgepodge. I should let you know, by the way, that I think virtually all the manuscripts of Lovecraft. Uh, that Brown has is, are now available for anyone to look at. It is called the Brown Digital Repository. You can access any of these manuscripts. You can look at them uh, to your heart's content. They are very well scanned. You can, you know, they, they, you can enlarge them. You can reduce them. Downloading is pretty difficult because they're huge files, but they're all out there if you want to look at them yourself. And I'm probably going to. Um, so, I mean, Lovecraft attracts a certain base of weird fiction readers um, in a way that no one, except maybe Robert W. Chambers, um, modernly have mm -hmm. latched onto. So my, my, I think I have my answer for this, but I'm really, really dying to hear yours. What makes Lovecraft different than the Clark Ashton Smiths and the Frank Belcap Long and the Manly Wade Wellmans of that time period? What was, what was it that made him endure for a century Whereas a lot of these other writers outside of Lovecraft fans probably would have faded. Well, it's a complicated uh, issue. I think there are a number of factors here. Um, uh, okay, first of all, I think Lovecraft came to maturity as a writer, early twenties, let's say, and he had he was well read in weird fiction. In fact, throughout his life, he he searched for the kind of weird fiction that he wanted. To read and to write, never quite found it, uh, except you know, you know, obviously Poe and some other writers. But uh, Machen, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, he yeah, Arthur Machen was a was a tremendous discovery. Dunsany too, although he wrote fantasy. Although that that kind of that distinction wasn't there at the time. I mean, Lovecraft considered that part of weird fiction too. Um, <clears throat> but he was writing at a time when a lot of these standard. Uh, you know, motif that I mean, you mentioned them before, like the ghost, the vampire, the werewolf, they'd all been played out. Uh, some of them had been done to death. <clears throat> and it was not simply that a lot of writers had used these. Lovecraft, who was very well read in the sciences and also uh, in philosophy as well, recognized that the advance of science had made a lot of these conceptions totally unbelievable to educated people. I mean, you know, each, it, it, they can't be used in weird fiction anymore uh, because they just they don't they don't you don't get that suspension of disbelief. So he had to come up with different ideas, the whole a whole different um, mechanism to create weird effects. And for him, the solution was to to uh, you know explore the vast reaches of, of space, which was still largely unexplored. I mean, there's, there are limits to how far we can examine or you know, understand what is out there in the universe. And that's where he came up with these these kind of synthetic monsters or gods, if you want to call them that, um, you know, of the, of the Kuru mythos. And, and, you know, through one story after the other in a sort of tr almost trial and error way, he created this, this whole new sort of cosmology, um, uh, you know, that, that builds upon its, each other, you know, a lot of his stories of the last 10 years actually end up being sort of fragments of this enormous novel, if you can think of it that way. And that helps to draw the reader in. They're not individual stories. They're, they're, they're you know, they're interconnected in a very complex way. And they, they create this whole universe of horror. The other thing is, 
it's funny, Lovecraft sometimes gets criticized for not uh, talking about some, you know, some of the particulars of, of, of uh, what's going on, especially like his characters, like his characters don't eat very much or, you know, <laughs> You know they don't. You know they don't do some of these mundane things that that uh, uh, people expect out of out of out of literary characters. But that's actually becomes a virtue because it it renders Lovecraft stories timeless in a way that a lot of the other fiction of that era isn't. You know, it's because you don't really have to understand the whole culture of the nineteen twenties and thirties to get Lovecraft. He he deals with much broader issues. Uh, than that, you know, the issue basically of where where do we human beings stand in the universe? What is our place in in existence? You know, uh, what you know, the, and all sorts of other issues that are so much broader than than you know class distinctions or, or you know even gender and stuff like that. It's just those things just weren't of interest to him. He wanted to look at the big picture, and I think that's a large part of his uh, appeal. It, it's um, so great to hear you talk about how the tapestry that we call the Cthulhu Mythos, but that's probably, I mean, there's definitely a debate there whether that's an appropriate distinction, but we refer to it broadly as the Mythos. Um, but I mean, I was blown away when I, because one of the last things of Lovecraft I got around to reading of the canon, the proper canon, was mm -hmm. um, the dream, dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. And when I got to the end and I realized the whole story was a Nilarthotep story, Mm -hmm. I, I think I just lost it because I, I, I really was not expecting it to be combined with the existing stories. And it yeah, was mind-blowing to me. I have to confess, yeah. I mean, I, I, a lot of people have difficulty with that story because it seems kind of shapeless and it just kind of meanders around, doesn't doesn't really seem to have a focus. Um, and, of course, it is it is fantasy, like Dunsany yeah. or Tolkien or something like that. It's not horror in that sense, uh, except some individual episodes maybe. <clears throat> that story was written at a very critical moment in Lovecraft's life, and actually, I think he, one one's appreciation appreciation of it is enhanced if you understand where that's coming from in his life. He had just come back from these horrible two years in New York, you know, where he yes. didn't, didn't fit in. It was a horrible place. I'll tell you, I lived a long time in New York City. <laughs> I know what he's talking about. I mean, I wasn't as poor as he was, but it it can be a pretty horrible place if you if you're in that situation. Um, He'd come back to his beloved Providence, Rhode Island, and said, "Oh my God, I, he felt at home again." You know, unfortunately, his, his his marriage didn't work out, and I think he don't think he was suited to be a married guy. I'm just sorry, he just he just wasn't. Um, so he was back here alone with his aunts. He had two aunts to look after him, um, and that story basically is a chronicle of his homecoming. Here's Randolph Carter, who wanders all through Dreamland looking for this Sunset City, as he calls it only to realize that that city is the memories, not the city itself, but the memories of his childhood growing up in Boston. So it's clear that Lovecraft is talking about himself there. And that, that final speech of Nair Lathotep, where, where he reveals that to Carter, is one of the most poignant moments in all of Lovecraft. It, it brings tears to my eyes. It blew me away. Blew me away. And, and I... I, I want to tell anyone out there that wants uh, it sounds like we just spoiled something we really didn't you because if you read lovecraft in the right order you'll still feel it <laughs> yeah if you start right. with it if you start with that story it might be an issue but um yeah. Love, lovecraft, I mean, actually, you know it's it's it, there are very few surprises in lovecraft there are only a couple of stories that have a surprise ending otherwise it's you almost know from the beginning of the story what's going to happen so it's it's hard to hard to have a spoiler sometimes he just literally tells you in the second paragraph how it's going to yeah, end exactly um so, I want to talk a little bit about August Derleth. Mm. Um, before we went on the air, we I, I said that I felt that he kind of passed the baton to you without knowing it. Um, certainly, we wouldn't have Lovecraft at all without Derleth, um, or we would he'd be he wouldn't be in the public consciousness nearly the way he is. But towards the end of August's life, he was plying on Lovecraft's name pretty hard. And may have even damaged some of the reputation in certain quarters, literary in certain literary quarters. I think that's fair to say. So he's a complex figure. I mean, you stepped kind of into his shoes to kind of reinvent the Lovecraft canon back into its original image. What are your feelings about him as both a friend of Lovecraft and as an editor slash caretaker? 
Yeah, well, I've, I've spoken out on Derleth a lot, and uh, <clears throat> Derleth has his devotees and fans, too, and they don't they don't like me, and I understandably, I, I <laughs> they shouldn't like me because I, I've been pretty hard on him. Uh, I'll tell you, um, <clears throat> this is a very complex argument. Would, <clears throat> would Lovecraft have emerged? Would he have survived without Derleth? We just don't know. It's, a, it's true. When Lovecraft died, he literally had no book of his stories published, you know, in his life. I mean, he had one crappy little edition of The Shadow Over Innsmouth that, you know, some, some friend of his published in like a hundred copies or something. It was an unbelievably bad uh, typo-ridden book that never really got into distribution. All right. All this stuff is basically stuck in the pulp magazines, you know, weird tales, astounding stories, wherever. And, okay, give, give Daryl due credit. He did take the effort and the time and the money. He spent a lot of money establishing Arkham House, publishing Lovecraft's books, um, you know. And um, he had already developed an independent reputation as a, as a mainstream writer. He had already published several books, and actually pretty good books, I'll tell you. Derleth was a good mainstream writer. Those, those books he wrote about Wisconsin, the Back Prairie Saga, are actually quite good. Um, that's where his talents lie. His talents actually don't lie in weird fiction, uh, even though he <laughs> devoted his life to publishing it. Fine. Um, <clears throat> so he did get Arkham House off the ground. He got Lovecraft this initial wave of publicity in the early, late 30s, early 40s, and, and on up. Um, but yes, I think his con constant harping on this mythos, uh, you know, writing these stories that are really, I'm sorry to say, bad, bad stories that he wrote Sometimes he called them posthumous collaborations with Lovecraft. I don't even know what that could possibly mean, but uh, he chose these little fragments and stitched them together and made these stories that they're really bad stories, I'm sorry. And and yes, some critics like Damon Knight and Avram Davidson and others in the 50s and 60s criticized Lovecraft for, for Derleth's failings, and that, that was bad. And in a sense, Derleth tried to control Lovecraft. He didn't like Lovecraft getting out of his own, you know, uh, control. Uh, he did manage to get Lovecraft over into England in the 50s. You know, so, uh, the British editions came out in the 50s. He got Lovecraft translated into a couple languages, French and Spanish and some others. Um, but basically, he exercised tight control over Lovecraft. He actually claimed to own Lovecraft's copyrights, which, in fact, he didn't. I mean, that was frankly illegal, <laughs> but no matter... Um, and so I'm sorry to say it, but it almost took his death to liberate Lovecraft, you know, um, and obviously I didn't step in there with that intention of taking it over because I was, I was a teenager at the time. Um, but Mozig, Dirk Mozig and others were, were had, had set the, uh, kind of, kind of laid the groundwork and, but Mozig himself said, you know, we need somebody at Brown University because, and somebody who can spend years and years there because that's the only way that somebody can really learn about Lovecraft. There's so much information there that, and, and I said, okay, I'll do my best. And, I, and it's, I, luckily I got in and I learned all this stuff and I, I'm still learning on Lovecraft, but I, I've used that knowledge to, to carry me forward. And uh, we should be thankful that you did um, because, you know, after Derleth and Derleth's daughter to a degree, there wasn't really, uh, there was had been this explosion in the 60s of popularity um, as Connor culture kind of embraced Lovecraft for the psychedelic um, mm -hmm. literature of the time kind of reflected Lovecraft and certainly a band took his name. But there was kind of a gap in there of kind of directionless uh, moment for Lovecraft's future. So it wasn't really until your editions, uh, you know, your revised editions come out that the more literary side of it um, gets embraced. So, I mean, I'd, I'd, we wouldn't have the Penguin Classics edition without you, period. And that gives yeah. a newfound respect to a man who died thinking he was a failure. I'll tell you, yeah. I mean, when I got into this field, you know, again, I, I was still a teenager, uh, you know, late teenager, I suppose. But even before I got to Brown, I said, you know we need to get Lovecraft on a higher level. I mean, the popularity is great. I, those Valentine editions, great wild covers, you know. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, I remember I was 15 years old 
and I, I you know, my, my, my parents subscribed to Time magazine, just we just subscribed. I was totally flabbergasted when there was a big review of these Lovecraft editions for Valentine in Time magazine. That was actually an important <laughs> moment, in kind of his his coming out. But uh, but again, the reviewer basically said he's just a popular sort of guy, you know, and you know uh, didn't suggest that he had a lot of literary qualities there. And I said, no, I think he does. I think he deserves a, 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 a higher level of understanding. So I began compiling an anthology of criticism which eventually became H.P. Lovecraft for decades of criticism. And I started approaching academic presses. I didn't go to the small presses. There are any number of small presses that could have published this book. But I said, no, no, we need to get, get this elsewhere to, to, to the attention of, of, of academics. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have any great fathers for academics, believe me. They're, they're, they're a bunch of pompous <laughs> assets for the most part. But they do, many of them, determine what is considered uh, you know, important literature. So you gotta, you got to push Lovecraft in front of their noses to get them to read them. Uh, and, you know, after years of effort, I got Lovecraft, I got that book published by an academic press, Ohio University Press, in 1980. And that was the first book on Lovecraft uh, from an academic press. And I just went on from there. Um, the Arkham House editions were great. I mean, they were not regarded as academic, of course, um, <clears throat> because that is a small press. But they, they got attention. Uh, and a lot of other scholars kept kept coming into the to the fold. Uh, Donald R. Burleson has done a lot of good work. Uh, Robert F. Price with that great magazine, Crypt of Clulu. That was that was that was fabulous. Um, and 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 this movement culminated in, in one sense in that H. P. Lovecraft Centennial Conference in 1990, which was sponsored by Brown University. And it was it was a tremendous event. Uh, you know, right around the time of Lovecraft's uh, birthday in in, in, in August. Uh, we got scholars from around the world to participate in these panel discussions, and it was written up in uh, certainly in the local newspapers, and I think elsewhere also. Uh, it really was a great moment, and I think it, it set the, the 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 threshold for for you know these Penguin editions. They approached me, by the way. I did. I, I would not have dreamed that Penguin would have been interested in publishing you know Lovecraft in Penguin Classics. Um, so I was just I was, you could have knocked me over with a feather when they came <laughs> up with an offer to me. Um, and remember, I had also done this new biography, and I have to confess that I think that is an important work of mine, too. El Sprig de Camp's biography of 1975, important work, very important, um, because it, it got published with a big publisher, Doubleday, got all kinds of notices all over the, the world, you know, translated, too. Um, that really that helped put Lovecraft on the map um, in, in the literary sphere, but as time went on, people began to realize this, this is a pretty flawed biography, this guy was not the best person to write a Lovecraft biography. Um, he didn't really have the understanding of Lovecraft's mind to, to really get what Lovecraft was about. Um, and of course, the, there was more and more documentary evidence that, that had come, come to light in, 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 in the interim. And so in the early 90s, I said, well, I guess I'm the guy to do it. So I, I wrote this <laughs> biography, which even then was only published in abridged form in 1996 as H.P. Lovecraft, A Life, and then 15 years later was published in full form as I Am Providence. But uh, I put a lot of work in that biography, and I, I, I like to think that that paints a pretty full portrait of Lovecraft. Before we get lost, because uh, I'm going to get, I'm going to lose the, the chats because uh, the, the comments come and go. Mm. Uh, Griffin asks, what did you, what did S.T. think of the film The Haunted Palace with Vincent Price? Oh. Which, of course, is based on Charles Dexter Ward, kind of, if you squint and hold your head to the side. It's pretty corny at this point. I mean, maybe it was meant to be corny and campy. I don't know. Um, I, I'm actually surprised that it wasn't better than it was because the screenplay was written by Charles Beaumont, who was a really fine writer of weird fiction. You would think he'd have a little better sensitivity to... <laughs> To what Lovecraft was about, but maybe you—I don't think at that time, early '60s, you could really do a good adaptation of Lovecraft. You had to do it in the conventional B movie format, you know that 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 film is in. Uh, I don't think audiences would have understood or appreciated anything that was really Lovecraftian. It, it was a good effort in in some regards. It, again, it helped, uh, kind of helped put Lovecraft on the map. I mean, it, you know, it fo was followed up by. Die, Monster, Die, which is even worse <laughs> with Boris Karloff, and then there's that Shuttered Room film, which is not even really Lovecraft, but let it pass. But, you know, and then, then the Dunwich Horror, the, that's pretty unspeakable. Uh, 
oh god, Dean Stockwell and Sandra D. Um, actually, the best character in there was uh, Ed Begley. I think didn't he play Wizard Wheatley? Um, yep, so he was fun, but. Uh, <clears throat> That one, at least you can kind of you can see the Lovecraft influence a whole lot clearer. Um, oh sure. It, sure, it doesn't it doesn't play really, and the psychedelic effects have not aged well at all. Oh. But um, of the three, I think it would be the one that you can see the most Lovecraft in. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, I'll tell you. Lovecraft is not fair uh, no. well in 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 film, but we can we can go on that later. Well, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Farnsworth Wright. Mm. Um, obviously, he was Lovecraft's great white whale in many ways. Uh, the editor of Weird Tales, and that was the big repository of the day's weird fiction. That was the glittering prize, as it were, in the small press. And although he did he he did buy Lovecraft stories, and those their collaborations really probably are the jumping off point. For the whatever success he had during his life, he was pretty brutal in his correspondence with Lovecraft. When you well, yeah, this is this is a complex issue too. But Wright claimed to have great admiration for Lovecraft as a writer. The difficulty Wright was facing was he had to keep this magazine going, especially in the in the you know uh, tough years of the early years of the Depression. Um, and he was basically timid. He didn't want to publish really, um, I wouldn't say controversial material exactly. I want, I want to say something like, you know, forward looking or, or, or material that really expanded the whole boundaries of Pulp Fiction. And that's where Lovecraft was headed. His early stories do more or less conform to the kind of stories Weird Tales wanted. Uh, you know, these are more short macabre stories like The Outsider. I mean, it's a great story, but it's basically. Yeah. Exactly. You know, yeah, those those stories were snapped up quickly, but when he started writing longer and longer stories, I mean, <laughs> from a commercial standpoint, it was difficult. Um, I mean, somehow, Whisper and Darkness got published in in one issue. It's a huge story, twenty five thousand <laughs> word story in one issue, almost a you know, a, a, you know novella. It certainly is. But when it, when he came to the Mouths of Madness, Wright said, "I like this story, <clears throat> but." I can't publish it as a serial because in Weird Tales, the serials, you know, two or three, four or five issues, however many, they had to have recognizable characters. They had to have a lot of action because that's what kept the readers from, you know, buying, you know, one issue after another. And I'm sorry to say it, but Lovecraft, that story of all stories, simply is very slow moving. I think it's a great, great story. I, I think it's his best story from a purely literary standpoint. But from a commercial standpoint, especially from the standpoint of a, of a pulp magazine, it's just it's just not going to make it, you know. And and I mean, I'm surprised it actually even got us published by Astounding Stories later on. Uh, they did it as a three part serial, but they then shredded that story up, especially at the ending. They just hacked it to pieces, and Lovecraft was totally infuriated by that. But, <laughs> so right, yeah, it, I mean, he was facing all kinds of difficulties trying to keep Weird Tales afloat, and. Um, you know, it's just happened. And, and and Lovecraft, you know, he was never a professional writer in the in the literal sense of the term. I mean, he couldn't publish his stuff anywhere else. It it had to go to Weird Tales. There was really no other market for his stuff. Um, and and so Wright basically had him over a barrel. Um, and and what happened was that Lovecraft couldn't separate himself enough from rejections. I mean. He took rejection very hard. That was just a, a personal foible of his. He he didn't. Well, I think he did understand that Wright's attitude was commercial, but it took it took it he took it personally, and and you know it got him very, you know, embittered and and disheartened, and and it actually it, it contributed to his lack of writing in in his later years because he felt that it was some sort of personal rebuff. And it wasn't, but but that's how Lovecraft took it. I mean, it, it's unfortunate that he took it that way, but there it is. In the uh, public sphere of people who kind of hear the mythology surrounding Lovecraft, they constantly hear that he was a recluse. But he was a guy who actually traveled a lot during his life. He traveled um, way more than I did. Certainly, I, more than I, 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 That's what I've always thought. Um, 
but uh, he has this reputation that people think they just uh, rolled around Providence's graveyards in the middle of the night and uh, wrote during the day when he got up. Um, but he was actually, a, he traveled through most of the country. I mean, yeah, it's well, pretty remarkable. Big part of the country. I mean, yeah. For one thing, uh, um, Lovecraft, I think, in some ways cultivated that image. I think he kind of wanted to portray himself in that fashion, and he does so in, in, in correspondence sometimes. I think it tickled him to, to be thought of that way. Um, but those that these travels that he undertook, especially the last 10 years of his life, very important to him. That was his really his one way of getting out, not only just out in the world, but getting out of himself and really understanding uh, the history of this country. I mean, he he was a great devotee of the past. You know, I mean, he, he just felt the past was so rich and so interesting that he had to explore it on this very very granular uh, physical level. So he went up all the way up to Quebec, Canada. He went all the way down to Key West, Florida, and all places in between. He loved Charleston, South Carolina. It, it was kind of like a southern providence. I've been there, uh, and, and I I know what he's talking about. Uh, even New York, I mean, even those horrible two years in New York, he looked up, you know, all these, uh, you know, old things that, that still survived in, in various corners of the metropolis. Um, Philadelphia, Washington, you know, you name it. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, he didn't get any farther west than, well, either if Cleveland or New Orleans. I don't know how, which, which one is farther west, but he didn't ever cross the Mississippi, really speaking. He'd love to have gotten over to California to see Clark Ashton Smith, but he just, you know, he would have had to travel by bus or train and they would take it forever and he just didn't have the resources to do that. Um, but in terms of, of his... Of his uh, this reclusiveness. I mean, you know, he didn't meet a lot of people physically face to face because he was more interested in exchanging ideas. And that's why he had this correspondence that spanned the globe, really, but most mostly the U.S. But he sought out people who, not just his own interests, but, you know, of c competing interests, so they could discuss all these issues of, of, of uh, you know, of interest, whether it be philosophy or science or literature or politics or whatever. He had a tremendously wide range of interests. Uh, and, and his correspondence, which I'm in the course of publishing in 25 volumes, uh, <laughs> reflects that. It's interesting because before you mentioned that he was always chronically short on paper, but the man didn't think anything of writing an eight-page uh, letter to a, a new acquaintance through the mail. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it shows you his priorities because, you know, one of the things that, that to me is most admirable about Lovecraft, he considered himself a gentleman. Now, maybe that has some class connotations that we don't appreciate anymore, but to be a gentleman means if somebody writes you a letter, you write back. I mean, that's just what you do, you know, and, and he felt obligated to do that, and he enjoyed doing that. Um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the physical thing about paper, uh, his friend George Kirk had once given him this enormous stack of of, of paper from from his book uh, book business. But when when Kirk moved uh, locations, the, the the address at the top of the uh, uh, the stationery there was it was you know outdated, so he couldn't use that paper anymore. So he just gave it to Lovecraft, gave all these envelopes to Lovecraft too. So that helped Lovecraft. He, he thought that would last him forever, but he used it all up. In a, in a couple of years, but uh, um, uh, I'll tell you, Lovecraft. You, you got, you, as I say, you can look at all this stuff at Brown University. The the, the letters he wrote. I mean, I'll tell you, the, that spidery handwriting, covering both sides of the page, sometimes going on for 20, 30, 40 pages. I mean, my God, you know, there there are whole letters that are that are longer than any of his stories. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> And it's it's interesting because the people talk about the Lovecraft circle, but it was way wider than a circle. Uh, he had a lot of people he was in correspondence with. Um, At the end of his life, he says he was in touch with almost a hundred people on a on a you know fairly regular basis. Just unbelievable. I mean, and and these people were from this you know initially from this amateur amateur press movement that he got involved with in the in the teens and twenties. Uh, obviously, you know, a certain number of writers from Weird Tales or fans like J. Vernon Shea, who I was privileged enough to know uh, later on. Um, you know, the young young disciples like Donald Wolheim or Fritz Leiber or Block. Um, but other people, you know, were just, you know, 
literary types. There's a, there was a, a woman poet named Elizabeth Toldridge. He wrote to her for nine, right. and, nine years. So, uh, and, and those letters are actually kind of the most fascinating because he's so supportive, which I, I think you don't, very you don't often, we don't hear that about Lovecraft. We don't hear like the fact that the man was kind to other writers. I'll tell you, a lot of the devotion that comes from people that who knew him and never even met him, like Block and even Derleth, stem from the fact that Lovecraft was so supportive and so encouraging and so helpful on a on a on a literally you know literal level. He would he would read these manuscripts and and write pages and pages of commentary saying, okay, you did this right, but maybe you don't do this uh, over again, and and maybe you know fix up the language here, blah blah blah. I mean, enormous. If you want to think of it, a waste of time, a waste of his own time. He could have been writing his own stuff. But again, this is the gentlemanly aspect of life. He felt he had to do this, and he wanted to do it. He liked being a teacher. He wanted to help these writers, you know, get ahead and, and, and improve. And uh, that's why they were so devoted to him afterwards. Robert Block who has said, you know, if I had known how sick Lovecraft was in 1937, I would have crawled on my hands and knees from, from Milwaukee to Providence to be at his bedside. And he'd never met him. He only corresponded with him for four years. It's interesting, too, because I think Lovecraft actually cared about these people. And and that's that's kind of a rare commodity at any time in history. But from someone that portrayed himself as somewhat aloof in attitude, he was actually very gentle to the people he took under his wing. Um, one of his peers, death, really shook him and probably changed his life from that to point on, and that's Robert E. Howard. Mm. Those letters um, where he's talking to people about the death of Howard, it, they are heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, remember, he never met Howard. You know, he, They almost met um, back in, in down in 1932 when Lovecraft was you know, in New Orleans, but Howard just couldn't get up the money to go from Texas to, to New Orleans, and he bitterly regretted that for the rest of his short life. But um, their correspondence, you know, their correspondence is huge, for one thing. It takes two volumes of, of, of our edition. Um, and at times it gets a little testy. You can tell they were kind of getting annoyed with each other sometimes, but they clearly respected each other. They each had tremendously conflicting views on almost everything. <laughs> But they had this on somehow, you know, whether it's weird fiction, whether it's uh, something else. But, uh, um, you know, they kept writing back to each other. And, and they didn't, they didn't uh, ever say, that's it. I'm, I'm done with you. Um, and Lovecraft, was, yeah, he was really shaken. That that year of 1936, when Howard died, a lot of other bad things happened to Lovecraft. It was a really bad year for him. And, of course, I think toward the end of the, and, and, end of that year, I think he knew he was uh, he, he got some bad <laughs> medical <laughs> uh, uh, treatment, or, you know, uh, diagnosis from from a doctor. I I think by the by December he knew he was going to die, uh, and he he never told anybody. He didn't want to, you know, he didn't want sympathy from people. He said, you know, he just tried to carry on as always, you know. And then he did die in March of 1937. And the final letter he sends is completely open ended. He talks about going into the hospital because. But there's a sense that he's going to return and finish, you know, the communications in a separate letter, and it's really well, disquieting knowing that that's the end. He wanted to put. He just he didn't is he didn't want to uh, um, disturb other people. You know, he didn't want to uh, again say, "Oh, I'm I'm dying. Won't you? Won't you? Uh, you know, cry for me?" Uh, and yet, that's why when he did die, it was, you know, his his all all his. Uh, uh, friends just couldn't believe it because they simply didn't know. Uh, sorry, that's my phone. There, he didn't. They didn't know how sick he was. He just didn't tell anybody. Um, and so, yeah, they they were shocked. And August Derleth, I'll tell you, he had never met Lovecraft. He corresponded with him for eleven years, and and he has a really poignant uh, uh, story of how he went out into the fields, you know, in some, in one of his beloved area of Wisconsin, and just you know, he just thought about Lovecraft, and uh, very poignant. So Lovecraft dies in a situation where his, his literary future is extremely unknowable. Um, he'd done work in his life that should have brought fame. I mean, he ghost wrote for Harry Houdini. 
that should by itself have indicated that he should have been given some, you know, post-mortem, uh, at least print, but that was not certain really. And it, it becomes his friends initially who pull together and keep him in print. It's, it's disquieting when you compare it with other literary figures, especially in the horror genre, which were in, enjoyed tremendous success during their life, and it was almost guaranteed that there would be an afterlife. Lovecraft has had the longest shadow I can imagine in the genre, but he will, will you know, he in his lifetime did not enjoy that certainty that anyone would be reading this even five years after his death. Well, I'll tell you, you know, he tried, actually he didn't even try, he he got queries from, from book publishers, Alfred Knopf, um, G.P. Putnam's Sons, you know, several leading book publishers inquired about, you know, wh whether Lovecraft had anything they would want to publish. You know, but then, even then, in the 30s and 20s even, weird fiction was actually fairly popular, um, but they wanted novels. These publishers wanted novels, just like today. You know, there's a prejudice against short story collections. You know, a lot of publishers just don't want to deal with it because they think novels, you know, people want to read novels more than they want to read short stories. Who knows? Uh, Lovecraft was devoted to the short story and the novella because he felt that's where weird fiction worked best. And I think he's right about that. Um, so he said, I don't have any novels. You know, he didn't want to, you know, he probably could have published Charles Dickens Award, you know, in his lifetime if, if he had gotten the energy to type it up, but he just he just didn't think it was a, a good piece of work. So he sent these short stories out to these publishers, and, you know, some of them liked them, but he, he himself was not a good promoter of his work. And that, again, goes back to this gentlemanly stance of his, because a gentleman doesn't, you know, boast about himself. He doesn't, you know, promote himself in that sense. But, you know, if you're a writer, you kind of have to do that. You know, uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> nobody else is going to do it for I you. <laughs> Yeah. Kind of what so, I'm doing here. <laughs> I know. So it's like, you know, Lovecraft just, I mean, it just, uh, you know, it just didn't happen. And uh, I guess we really, we are lucky that, that uh, his friends took so much um, effort uh, to, to rescue his work from, from the pulp magazine. And then we're especially lucky that uh, you come along long, long after Lovecraft is dead to make sure the texts are remembered properly. Because if not you, I don't know that it would have happened. Well, I have to confess, yeah. I mean, uh, it was a, a fortuitous concatenation of circumstances, if you want to know what I mean. Uh, first, the fact that I got into Brown, okay, and now I, I had at least four years there. In the end, I had six years because I did a master's as well. At the same time, I, I didn't actually study English at Brown. I thought I would, but I didn't like the English department for various reasons. It just wasn't it wasn't where I felt comfortable. I started studying classics, which what that means is Latin and Greek and ancient history and, and even some ancient philosophy and stuff like that. And what that did was it showed me how texts are transmitted for, you know, from, from classical antiquity all the way to the present day. It's a very complicated procedure how that happened, you know, and that gave me the knowledge to understand how Lovecraft's texts got, got transmitted. Um, because it's not it's not a simple thing of saying oh here's a manuscript let's just follow the manuscript it's it's, it's a way more complicated procedure than that and and the the stuff that I was learning in my regular classes I put to use uh, in studying Lovecraft and and working on his text so it was just it was just a lucky coincidence that that happened um, and I'm still using that knowledge uh, I actually published what is called a variorum edition uh, a few years ago with Hippocampus uh, uh, complete stories of Lovecraft now what that means is uh, an edition in which the textual variants in all the important texts of Lovecraft over the years uh, are listed. And you can see how these errors kind of accumulate from one publication to the next. You know, an error starts here and then it gets reprinted and then it gets a further error. And it's just, it's, it, it becomes a nightmare uh, at the end. But uh, so it's, it was, as I tell you, Working on, on Lovecraft's manuscripts has been the most rewarding thing that I've ever done uh, in my personal life, and I hope that, it, that it, uh, it shows. I think it does. Is there a single story from Lovecraft that most resonates with you? <clears throat> well, I've always thought of the Mountains of Madness is his greatest 
story from, from a literary standpoint. Uh, I mean, it's a hard story to get into. And in fact, when I first tried to read it at the age of 13, and I was like an ignoramus in science, I didn't know anything about science. I, I, I just couldn't get through it. Uh, I had to come back later and read it, but it, it is tremendously impressive work. I, I have said in print that that final encounter uh, with the Shoggoth may be the greatest moment in horror fiction, the greatest, the most frightening episode in the entire history of weird fiction. Um, and I, I think Shadow Out of Time is another great story, and I, I, that's why I felt so privileged to be allowed to look at that manuscript and, and read the story as he himself wrote it back in 1934, um, after all these years. Um, the Outsider is funny. I love that story. And, and when I was 14, I came, like, a fraction of an inch from guessing the ending, but I didn't quite say no. I, I didn't quite get it. Um, uh, but that story still sticks with me. And The Rats in the Walls is another tremendously powerful story. I think that's actually a very good story to start with because it doesn't have all the, the gods and stuff. You know, it is readily understandable. Uh, but it's a very, very rich story. It has so much there in, a, in, in just 20 pages. Um, very powerful story. I, I, I would agree with that. I'd also say Pickman's model is the other one that probably is an easy gateway story. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the cultural relevance of Lovecraft uh, as mm -hmm. we wind down here. Um, first off, has there been any media adaptions of Lovecraft that you think are truly worthy? I can think of a couple, but one in particular to me stands out. <clears throat> it's a German production that came out, you know, I think in 2010 or thereabouts. In German, it's called Die Farbe, which is the color. Um, it is a magnificent adaptation of the color out of space. I mean, just magnificent. It's kind of hard to find. I think you have to, you can get a DVD of it from the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. I don't think it's on Netflix or anything like that. It's it's a little, it, it takes some effort to find it, um, but you can find it. Um, it was actually, even though it's a German production, the director is Vietnamese. I think his name is Juan Vu or something like that. A brilliant, brilliant director. Um, that's well worth watching. He, he was going to do a, a film on the Dreamlands, a live action film. I don't don't think he ever got around to it. And maybe he doesn't. Uh, I'd love to see that's something pretty, like that. But um, that, the that's other pretty thing ambitious. I, yeah, I'll tell you. I mean, I, 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 nothing like that has really been done. It's 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 a wide open field, but. Uh, Otherwise, uh, the HP Lovecraft Historical Society did a like a what short film of the Call of Tulu, a short silent film. That's really yeah. clever. I mean, it's, it may not be a great film, but it's it's very well done. I thought I, I didn't care so much for that Whisper in Darkness uh, full length film, but it, that that it has some moments too. Uh, and I'm sorry to say I, I'm not a big fan of Richard Stanley's Color Out of Space. I think he missed a lot of opportunities for for doing a really good film. He departed so much from the story that it's a very loose adaptation. Ivan Zacon also did an adaptation of Color Out of Space. Um, it, 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 it's really good as its own thing, but it is a big departure as well. Mm. Um, visually, it's stunning. Well, so I guess that's that wins you a lot of battles in that, my book. Huh. So where do you see Lovecraft going from here? Um, where do you do you do you see his popularity continuing to grow in media as maybe better films come out to represent him or do you where do you see him going? Oh yeah, I I just wrote a book. I hope it'll be published next year. It's called The Recognition of H.P. Lovecraft. And I, I trace the history of his emergence from total obscurity in his own time up to where we are now. What most people don't realize is Lovecraft is. He may be huge in the U.S., but he's even huger internationally. You can't believe how many foreign editions of Lovecraft are out there. In every language you can imagine, I mean, Russian, Chinese, Serbo-Croatian, uh, Galician, Catalan, uh, you know, Turkish, uh, Arabic. There's actually an edition in Arabic. I think Lovecraft would have been delighted, you know, given the... Yeah, absolutely. The, on and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I, it's it's impossible to chart them. There's so many things out there um, overseas. And he is regarded as a major figure overseas. He's still not quite there yet. I think he's getting there in the U.S. and, and, and in the English-speaking world. But in, in internationally, he is regarded as one of the great uh, writers of his time. 
Um, and there actually there are foreign, ad foreign adaptations of films too. I haven't seen very many of those, but they're out there apparently. Um, so he, I think his popularity and and his reputation will will continue to rise. He's even founded apparently, or, or has been the source of this new philosophical movement called weird realism. I don't, I don't even know what that's about, but whatever, it's out there. Uh, so you know, it's it's impossible to tell where Lovecraft's going to go. I mean, you know, we know all the merchandising, the the Tulu plush dolls, and all this other stuff. Lovecraft is, you know, ch their Lovecraft children's books. Uh, um, I got a Lovecraft animated, book. Animated children's movies. Yeah, absolutely. They yeah, exist. Little, I know. I, 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 again, I haven't seen them, but they're out there. They're not very I, good. I, I'm just flattered. I, mean, I just couldn't imagine. Because remember, when I got into this field in late 60s, early 70s, believe me, I mean, okay, the Valentine paperbacks were just starting to get popular, but otherwise he was totally unknown. I mean, you know, I never found anybody in my personal acquaintance who had ever read Lovecraft. I mean, I think I got some of my buddies, uh, you know, to read him, but otherwise they, they didn't know who he was. Um, and the number of people who were interested in him, you know, on a scholarly level were, you know, you can count them on one hand practically. And now it's just, it's, it's everywhere. He's amazing. Absolutely. At the point where you have Funko Pops based on you, you know you made it, I guess. All right. So I want to uh, run the promo for what's coming up on the channel. On the other side, uh, we'll let everyone know how they can keep in touch with everything you have going. And uh, and we'll go through the chat one more time for any final questions. So if you have anything, guys, get them in now. Hello. Oh. Well, that's Romulus, and I forget his last name. In my day, he was a feared witch judge and put many innocent, and possibly guilty, people to death. <laughs> Here, I made this for you. <laughs> Infamous witch Penny Dreadful. So yeah, I hope everyone can join us for a Penny Dreadful on uh, Thursday. So we're going from one extreme to the other. We're going from the basis of modern American literary horror to a uh, horror host. And that's what this show does best is switch gears, I guess. ST, it's been great having you here. How can people keep in touch with everything you've got going on and what's next uh, coming out? Well, I do, have a, uh, I do have a personal website, just stjoshi.org, O-R-G. Um, and I write a blog every, you know, a week or two, every, you know, sometimes three, sometimes I, I'm not that regular, but, uh, <clears throat> because I'm too busy writing, <laughs> doing stuff <laughs> to, to keep track of it. But, uh, um, uh, my main, my main goal right now is get Lovecraft's letters into print. I mean, I say it's going to go to 25 volumes. We've done, I don't know, 16, 17 volumes already with Hippocampus Press. Most of my, the publications uh, I, I'm doing is with Hippocampus Press, a great small press. Uh, we've basically done practically the entire work of Lovecraft, the fiction, the poetry, the essays, and now the letters. Um, and and that's that's been extremely rewarding, I'll tell you. Um, but I, I have interest in other writers. I want to do more work on Lord Dunsany. Um, uh, I'm going to have an edition of, of Ambrose Pierce coming out. Um, it's just, I mean... This field is just so rich and so diverse. I, I, I it's, it's hard to know to, uh, where to stop. I mean, there's just so many great writers out there you want to explore. And we're extremely thankful for you doing this hard work because honestly, again, I just don't see the appetite out there for most people to take this on. So it's an am amazingly important work to be doing and you've done amazing for us. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. I will add links to the description under this video. Uh, so if you're watching this on playback, right after you're done watching this show, please head over to the website 
and uh, check out everything you have going on. Any final words for the wa people watching? No, I'm, I think uh, I'm, I'm good here. Uh, <clears throat> still hanging on in Seattle, Washington, um, trying to keep <laughs> healthy and uh, uh, hope Safe. for the best. Yep. Well, thank you much, and I hope everyone will join us again on Thursday. Thanks, guys. <laughs>